Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Donald Hoffman. I am the president of the American Nuke Society. It's a distinct pleasure to be here with you this morning. It's an honor for us to have an opportunity to share with you the experiences that we've had in the United States with license renewal and our consideration of longer-term operation, or what we call subsequent license renewal. We're going to be talking today about a number of different things, and I'd at least start off to give you a sense that I had the pleasure of serving as an engineering officer in the Nuclear Submarine Navy in the United States for nine years, and then I served with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as a branch chief and director of the group reviewing the licenses from 1980 to 1985, just after a Three Mile Island event. And then in 1985, I started the consulting firm, and that particular company that's been working for 29 years, one of the things we do is work in license renewal. So we have interfaced with essentially all of the nuclear power plants in the United States, and for that matter, setting up infrastructure in several international regimes related to license renewal. So it is our hope that we will be able to share with you those lessons learned and those activities so that you can get some sense of what kinds of information, what kinds of activities you can leverage for the successful application here in your great country of France. This morning, we're going to be talking from five different perspectives, from the regulatory, from the commercial, from the research, from the communications and public outreach, and then from an owner-operator standpoint. I want to start off by saying, as President of the American Nuke Society, we represent all things nuclear science technology. So we're involved in everything that has any application thereof, whether it's mining, manufacturing, agriculture, energy, or medicine. So energy is only one part of the major activities that we participate in, but we acknowledge and recognize that it's important for us from the energy standpoint to facilitate a mechanism where we provide unbiased technical, scientifically, and technically based information to facilitate both our public and all of our stakeholders to understand the importance of what nuclear energy does for them. I'm sure you're aware that since 75 years ago with the discovery of fission in 1938, that nuclear science technology has done a great deal to enhance and improve the quality of lifestyle for humankind in a number of different applications, not the least of which is to provide energy. And so if you look at the activities we're talking about, the important aspect we see is that it's a very, very important for us to provide reliable, available, affordable, and environmentally friendly forms of energy, ones with low or essentially no carbon footprint, those which ensure the availability of electricity for all members of the human race. And that's a part of where we're heading. So we want to be able to talk about leveraging and utilizing the information from our current fleets. We believe that our current fleet of nuclear operating plants in the United States, and for that matter, in many parts of the world, are safely operating. They continue to share information. They continue to share best practices. They continue every day to enhance and improve their overall operational protocol. And in that sense, and even with the information that was gained in the post-Fukushima Daiichi event, all of the world took a harder look at the information that had already been utilizing and has now spending a great deal of time, effort, and money in enhancing and improving even further the safety of those facilities by the applications of the information and the lessons learned. It's important for you to note for us that safe operation is economic operation. And while many of our owner operators in the United States are economic entities in their own right, they recognize the significance and importance of a safety first protocol. Without that, we cannot be successful in any application. But as you know, license renewal and license, and license term or organization are related to an actual optimization by extending it is a systematic, in-depth, technical evaluation of all the reactor components and all the aspects of the operation of the facility to ensure the current licensing basis and the design basis are currently met and continue to be met over the duration of the license extension. As heard this morning, the 40 years was an initial stand time frame. In our Atomic Energy Act of 1954 in the United States, we established 40 years as an initial, as an initial term. But we acknowledge and recognize that we will continue to enhance and improve our knowledge and information according to reactor operation. New technologies would emerge, new information, new material studies, new research that would enable us to continue to evaluate not only where we were at the beginning of life of these nuclear facilities and all along the duration thereof, but also at the time when they were initially 
initially established to have their license terminated or to stop being in um, effect. So in 1999, Ms. Calvert Cliffs began to embark as the first plant in the United States to go towards license renewal. There was a great deal of effort that was conducted on the part of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the nuclear power industry, and all of our stakeholders to make sure we had the very dialogues that you're having today, that we had the discussions where we answered the difficult questions, where we established protocols and mechanisms for communication, where we ensured we were speaking to our stakeholders in a way in which they could easily understand that we were just as seriously interested than they were of continued safe operation of our nuclear facilities as they wanted us to be. And with that in mind, it's important to note that we have had a number of our plants already licensed through license renewal and a number that are under review now. And they have successfully gone through this evaluation and review. They have successfully continued to operate both safely and economically. And we are continuing to evaluate every day what we are learning through what we call our generic aging lessons learned, or our Gall report, and through continuous feedback. And it is through that feedback that we've continued to inform ourselves and inform our regulations and our regulatory infrastructure to ensure that we continue to safely operate our facilities. And it's through that kind of application of information and sharing that we believe we've been successful in the United States and we believe that the world can also head forward and move forward leveraging those kinds of lessons learned. So with that, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker in our panel this morning, which is John Lubinsky, who is our director of the License Renewal Branch of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. John. Thank you. Good morning. As stated, my name is John Lubinsky, and I am the director of the Division of License Renewal in the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I want to thank our host, Sven, today for organizing this conference and also focusing in on long-term operation. My goal today is to provide you an overview of the license renewal process for commercial nuclear power reactors focusing on the safety review for long-term operation. As Don has stated, uh, we regulate many different uh, nuclear activities within the U.S., but my focus today is going to be the commercial nuclear power reactors. The following is the agenda for my topics today. I will begin with an overview of the initial licensing, that is, the regulatory and safety process for the first 40 years of operations. This is important for our discussion today since it establishes the basis for determining the scope of license renewal and the scope of subsequent license renewal. Then I will discuss the first license renewal period, 40 to 60 years, and focus on the safety aspects of the review. I will conclude with the status of the NRC's activities for license renewal beyond 60 years. Let me start with initial licensing. We split our review into two parts during licensing, a safety review and an environmental review. For the safety review, the NRC staff reviews applications for operating reactors to determine whether the plant design meets all applicable requirements and regulations. The goal is to ensure adequate protection of public health and safety and the environment throughout the regulatory process, which includes through rulemakings, initial licensing, amendments to licenses, as well as inspection and oversight during the licensing period. The NRC staff also performs an environmental review in accordance with the National Environmental Policy Act to evaluate the potential environmental impacts and benefits of the proposed plants. After completing this review, the NRC issues a draft environmental impact statement. This is issued for comment by appropriate federal, state, and local agencies as well as any and all members of the public. After consideration of all comments received, the NRC issues a final environmental impact statement that addresses all the comments that were received during the process. It's these two reviews that provide the basis for the initial license issuance. This slide illustrates the principles of NRC's regulatory framework during the first 40 years of operations. The interrelationship between our regulations and guidance, licensing and oversight activities provides for adequate protection of public health and safety at every point during the plant's life. You will also notice the important function of reviewing operating experience which is shown on the left side of the uh, screen. 
This is important since we use this information to adjust our oversight activities and when necessary to change regulations or requirements on licensees. This is accomplished as issues are identified, whether it's for a plant-specific issue or an issue that we believe is generic across the industry. What's important to note here is we address these as they are identified. We do not wait until the license renewal period to do that. We will adjust the current licensing basis for the plants based on these changes. The most important part of this graphic is the interactive and continuous nature of all the activities. That is how the inspection and the operating experience provide feedback mechanisms to each other, as well as when issues are identified, we have a uh, support for the decision, which you'll see is the middle block, which helps us inform licensing and if necessary, changes licensing basis. So how do we accomplish these activities? To ensure continued safety throughout the life of plant operations, the NRC relies on the current regulatory processes. The NRC maintains constant oversight of licensees by performing inspections to verify that a licensee's activities are properly conducted to ensure safe operation. And this includes operating in accordance with the NRC's regulations. This includes full-time on-site resident inspectors and additional program inspections on a periodic basis. Licensees are required to implement the corrective actions based on the findings from these inspections. Also, NRC reviews whether any safety issues have any generic implications and whether or not these implications impact other plans. If so, we take appropriate action at the time they're identified. On a daily basis, the NRC reviews both international and domestic event information. The reviews focus both on the specifics of the event as well as performance of a trend analysis. These reviews determine whether any generic changes are needed to regulations, licensing requirements, or NRC's overpriced site programs. We also review inspection findings to perform a systematic assessment of performance of particular plant, uh, for a particular plant or facility to determine whether additional oversight is needed. Based on the results of this assessment, we adjust our oversight programs. The process is described on this and the previous slide ensures NRC identifies and resolves generic safety issues that affect more than one licensed facility. These are accomplished through additional inspections at all sites to verify safe operations, and when necessary, adding new requirements, either through the issuance of orders or modifying licensing requirements or our regulations. These actions are accomplished uh, as they are identified. So far, I've discussed the overall regulatory framework for licensing. However, this slide focuses on one aspect of the initial licensing process, and that is aging management, which we all hear aging management and think long-term operations. And I want to say that I believe some people think, and I say incorrectly, that aging management is unique just to license renewal. And we hear that many times in the United States. However, aging management is an important part of the initial licensing process and during the first 40 years of operation. It is primarily accomplished through implementation of three regulations, the NRC's maintenance rule, the quality assurance program, and the requirements in 10 CFR 5055A. The maintenance rule focuses on aging management of active components. It ensures a proactive oversight and changes based on results of licensees inspections and results of their testing. 10 CFR 5055A focuses on implementation of consensus industry standards, for example, the ASME code, and it applies to both active and passive components. It includes specific programs for inspections and testing as well as analysis of results to inform future licensee inspections based on those results. The quality assurance program is a requirement that ensures licensees implement effective corrective actions based on the operating experience gained from their inspections and testing programs. These concepts are important as we start to discuss the license renewal process. So first license renewal, that is that from 40 to 60 year period. Like initial licensing, the license renewal includes both safety and environmental reviews. The purpose of the safety review in the first license renewal is to provide reasonable assurance that actions have been or will be taken to manage aging of long-lived passive components important to safety throughout the period of operation. The environmental review, as part of the environmental review, the NRC assesses the, had assessed the environmental impacts 
of an additional 20 years of operation using a sample of 41 plants, and we published generic findings called a generic environmental impact statement for license renewal. The NRC looks at the generic impacts to see if there is new and significant information that would change those findings when an application is reviewed, and then go on to review the plant-specific impacts that were not able to disposition at the generic level. The total environmental impact of any plan on license renewal review is the composite of both the generic impacts and the plant-specific impacts. From an environmental standpoint, the ultimate conclusion to the environmental review is to determine whether the impacts are too large to approve license renewal. I would like to discuss more on the safety review as part of license renewal. I stated on the last slide that the purpose of the safety review for the first license renewal is to provide reasonable assurance that the actions have been or will be taken to manage aging of long-lived passive components important to safety throughout the period of operation. This slide includes the fundamental safety principles that support that focus and make the current license renewal uh, process possible. The first principle is that the existing regulatory process, that is, those implemented in the first 40 years and continue to be implemented during the license renewal period, is adequate to ensure that the current licensing basis provides and maintains an acceptable level of safety. The second is that each plant's current licensing basis is required to be maintained during the renewal period in the same manner and to the same extent as during original licensing. This includes any regulatory changes or requirements that were implemented during those 40-year period, and that could be implemented either as a requirement from the NRC or by the licensee changing their licensing basis on a voluntary basis, continue to be maintained during the, 40 -year, the additional 20-year period. Finally, additional focus on aging management effects is achieved through the verification of aging management program adequacy during the license renewal application review and through verifying implementation through inspections during the period of extended operation. These principles were established during the development of the license renewal rule, 10 CFR Part 54, and have guided us to where we are today with respect to specifically focusing on aging management of long-lived passive components. This slide is meant to illustrate, again, the overall regulatory process for safety during the license renewal period. The left side of this slide is the same as we discussed earlier. It is what we have established as the regulatory framework for the first 40 years, and it continues to be maintained and to be effective during the license renewal period. The aging management box to the right represents the additional licensing basis requirements for license renewal. It expands on the existing requirements for aging management of long-lived passive components. In addition, additional aging management is incorporated into the existing regulatory process. For example, the requirements for license renewal were established as part of rulemaking under Part 54. Licensing ensures implementation of generic and plant-specific aging management programs. Inspections to verify implementation of aging management programs are accomplished through our oversight process. And operating experience reviews include knowledge gain through implementation of aging management programs, both domestically and internationally. For all of these processes, lessons learned are evaluated and implemented both generically on a plant and on a plant-specific basis. Like the last slide, this slide demonstrates aging management requirements for the first 40 years with the inclusion of additional requirements for aging management of long-lived passive components. The left side is the same as I discussed earlier. The programs established for aging management of active components continues to be maintained and to be effective. The far right column demonstrates that there are additional requirements beyond those for the first 40 years for aging management of long-lived passive components. This is represented by the extended bar going into the third column for the passive components. This graphic represents that aging management of passive components is required during the first 40 years and expand it during license renewal. As a point of reference, a typical license renewal application consists of about 3,500 line items of components that require aging management of long-lived passive components. Some continue to be the same requirements that were applicable during the first 40 years, while others are expanded to ensure safety from 40 to 60 years. This slide provides a summary of what is reviewed in the the safety review process 
for long-lived passive components. I'll talk about each of the columns separately. The first column includes an assessment of whether the applicant has appropriately identified in the application the appropriate opponent components requiring aging management. These include safety-related components, non-safety components that affect safety-related functions, components that are relied on for compliance with other specific regulations. The scope of the system structures and components reviewed is similar to what we see under Part 50. However, the focus in license renewal is specifically on long-lived passive components. The second column represents whether the applicant has proposed the appropriate programs and activities to manage the components identified. For this, the staff relies on a document, the Generic Aging Lessons Learned Report. This report includes acceptable aging management programs which plants may use as a basis for license renewal. The staff verifies that the applicant's plant-specific operating experience is bounded by the conditions established in this Gall report, and applicants are able and encouraged to use any of the 50 generic aging management programs that are identified and recommended in the report. The staff verifies that the programs proposed by the applicant are consistent with the generic approach, that the applicant has justified that the generic approach is acceptable by demonstrating that their plant-specific conditions are bound by those assumptions in the report. Where their proposed programs are not consistent or not bounded by the generic assumptions, the applicant will take exceptions or provide enhancements to the proposed program and justify those on a plant-specific basis. These aging management programs are also intended to be living documents, I'm sorry, living programs that are updated over time accordingly based on operating experience and these are updated both by each individual licensee as well as the industry. And again, NRC does not wait to update its generic aging lessons learned report. While the report is officially, uh, has been officially uh, issued uh, every four to five years, we issue interim staff guidance. So if we identify concerns with aging management programs that had not been included in the Gall report, we will issue interim guidance and use that for applications that are under review as well as future applications. Oh, sorry. The, uh, the last box verifies that the applicant will incorporate the proposed aging management programs into their licensing basis. This is once again consistent with the second principle of license renewal mentioned earlier that licensees maintain their current licensing basis. In order to do so, the staff verifies the descriptions of the programs are included as part of the supplement to the licensing basis in the application. When renewed, it is a condition of the licensee's future maintenance and implementation of aging management programs and activities proposed. And inspectors verify this before the licensee enters its period of extended operation. The implementation of aging management programs continue to be monitored under the existing reactor oversight program. I'd like now to provide just a high level of summary of where we are from the license renewal. The first license was renewed for Calvert Cliffs and that was in uh, the year 2000. Since then, 73 units, almost 75% of the U.S. Uh, current fleet have received their renewed licenses. We have 18 additional units currently under review and the industry has indicated its intentions to submit eight additional license renew applications between 2014 and 2018. Oyster Creek was the first licensee to enter the first period of extended operation in 2009. By the end of 2014, 38 units will be in the period of extended operation. That is, they will have been operating more than 40 years. The older plants will reach the end of the first period of extended operation, that is, approach 60 years of operation in 2029. Part 54 allows licensees to submit an application for a subsequent license renewal, that is beyond 60 years, 20 years in advance of that period. So that is the same time as they're entering their first period of extended operation. We understand from the industry that the first application and most likely applications, multiple units, will come in for subsequent license renewal, licensing beyond 60 years in the year 2018. So what lessons learned do we have from the first license renewal? First, the existing principles of license renewal are effective. We rely on existing regulatory processes for safe operation. 
and we focus on issues re uniquely relevant to the period of extended operation, specifically aging management. These are effective due to continuous learning in license renewal reviews. We go through a hearing process where the public and other stakeholders are allowed to submit contentions, and we hear the different perspectives of the public through that process and what needs to be addressed. We gained experience from the 74 renewed licenses, as well as the 14 years of experience since the first renewal. And we gained experience in issuance of our generic aging lessons learned report, the GAL, which was first developed in 2001, revised and updated in 2005 and 2010, along with interim staff guidance along the way. When considering subsequent license renewal, the staff identified 600 recommendations for consideration for the regulatory and technical framework for subsequent license renewal. These lessons, along with the technical basis for safe operation beyond 60 years, will be critical for approaching and addressing subsequent license renewal. So, what is the NRC considering for subsequent license renewal? I need to start first with the disclaimer that you see at the bottom of the screen. The NRC Commission, our five commissioners, is cur are currently reviewing the staff's recommendation for changes needed for subsequent license renewal. Therefore, what I discuss in the following slides may change based on commission direction. With that noted, the staff believes the following regarding subsequent license renewal. We believe the fundamental safety principles for subsequent license renewal follow the same license renewal process principles and incorporate an increase in assessment of effectiveness of aging management activities. You can see on this slide that the first three bullets are the same I discussed for license renewal. The only addition for subsequent license renewal is to increase the assessment effectiveness of aging management activities. The staff reviewed the current regulatory and technical frameworks for license renewal to determine if any revisions need to be maintained to have reasonable assurance that aging degradation and its effects will be adequately managed for the 60 to 80 year period. The paper that I mentioned that includes this is before the commission, provides the results of the evaluation of the regulatory framework needed for subsequent license renewal, and therefore it addresses the policy issues associated with subsequent license renewal. The paper proposes changes to include minor modifications to the license renewal rule, updates to the rule with new requirements promulgated since the original rule, and new requirements for uh, ensuring effective, effectively addressing aging management. The paper was submitted to the commission in January of 2014 and the staff is awaiting a commission decision. The evaluation of the detailed technical issues will continue to be addressed through guidance development and issued in a revised goal document specific to subsequent license renewal. This slide is an expansion of the slides we saw earlier, both for the initial licensing and the license renewal. The only addition is expanded assurance of the effectiveness of aging management activities beyond 60. Again, this is based on the fact that the current programs and processes have demonstrated to be effective throughout the license renewal process and we believe will continue to be effective during the subsequent license renewals. Again, another modification to the slide we saw earlier, where we note that the same activities will apply with just the addition of the aging management effectiveness. The staff is proposing a requirement for licensees to take actions to ensure that their aging management programs remain effective by requiring periodic effectiveness assessments of their aging management programs, reporting age-related degradation to both NRC and the industry, so all have the knowledge, and then reporting changes that licensees have made to their aging management activities so that the NRC is aware of those changes. Instituting these requirements will ensure it's a consistent and timely feedback mechanism to alert NRC and the industry to what is going on in terms of changes and lessons learned in aging management. It will allow the staff that reasonable assurance that plants can effectively manage aging in the subsequent license renewal period. This slide discusses the additional requirements proposed by the staff in the SECI paper. As already discussed, the requirements to ensure that aging management programs remain effective reporting of age-related degradation and reporting of changes to the aging management activities to the NRC. This is the additional information you saw on the, block, on the final block on the last slide I mentioned. Two other 
changes that we're proposing is the first is that the current rule allows an applicant to submit a subsequent license renewal application at the same time it is entering its period of extended operation. That is right after 40 years. The staff is proposing to revise that rule to allow more time of operation before a licensee can submit an application. Therefore, having additional information on aging management as well as plant specific issues prior to reviewing a subsequent license renewal application. The staff also proposes to have applicants identify parameters that have changed over time and evaluate the impact of those on reasonable assurance with respect to aging management. This proposal acknowledges that the environment around these plants may have changed since they're first built and may have impacted the design and licensing. Any, I want to note that any changes to plant licensing basis as a result of the post-Fukushima rulemakings will, will be implemented prior to or in concert with the subsequent license renewal applications and anyone in the subsequent license renewal period will be required to meet those changes. I've talked a lot about some policy issues and regulatory framework. I'd like to discuss a little bit on the technical issues. The NRC, the Department of Energy, and the industry have been working to identify the technical issues to be resolved and changes that need to be made from a guidance document from the first license renewal period to provide a strong technical foundation for subsequent license renewal. We have an expanded materials degradation assessment. This was a joint effort between the NRC and DOE. The result of this expert elicitation will be published later this year so that we can have public engagement on the issues that we see important and need to be expanded for aging management. We also conducted aging management program effective audits at three plants that are currently in their period of extended operation to find any lessons learned as a result of implementation of those programs. And finally, we're continuing to get information from our reviews of domestic and international operating experience and considering that in what constitutes effective aging management programs. Earlier I noted that some aging management programs as currently designed and implemented will continue to be effective during the subsequent license renewal period. However, others will need to be expanded. Some will be more challenging to other than others. I believe this slide represents those that both the NRC and the industry believe are the major technical issues that must be addressed in considering operations beyond 60. They are the neutron embrittlement of reactor pressure vessels at high fluence, stress corrosion cracking of primary system components, concrete and containment performance after long-term radiation and high temperature exposure, and environmental qualification, performance, and in-service testing of cables. The industry is doing a lot of work in this area, a lot of research, along with NRC and the Department of Energy to ensure that effective aging management programs can be implemented beyond 60 years. I would like to summarize today by stating that we believe that plants are, I'm sorry, we believe it's safe as a safe basis for both license renewal and long, uh, subsequent license renewal because plants are required to meet their current licensing basis during initial licensing, during the first license renewal period, and during a subsequent license renewal period. The regulatory processes are effective for ensuring licensing basis is met and for identifying and resolving any safety issues throughout plant operations. And aging management is reviewed during initial license renewal, expanded during the first license renewal, and further expanded during subsequent license renewal. These principles ensure adequate protection of public health and safety throughout the entire lifetime of plant operation. With that, I thank you all for your attention this morning and look forward to questions later as part of the panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to advise you that it's our hope that you will understand that we'd like to have all the questions held to after all the panelists have spoken. Due to the integrated nature that the question was obviously posed, we'd like to offer each of the panelists an opportunity to respond to them. So having said that, I'd like to then th again thank John, who is our Director of Division of License Renewal in our Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation for his very informative presentation. Our next panelist is going to speak from a more commercial standpoint, and that is Mizu Tafazoli, who is the Manager of License Renewal Services Plant Life Extension Programs with Areva.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to present you the U.S. License Renewal Perspective and Solutions. License Renewal rule is clear. The challenge is to define a process to have predictability and transparency in, pre in preparing license renewal application. In my presentation, I would go through a brief license renewal overview in addition to what John already has presented. Industry activities and license renewal process, uh, project improvement process in the U.S. that includes typical project organization and also project staffing. License renewal, as John has presented in the presentation, uh, and I am just referring to it, has principle that, the, to me, one of the key principle is the plan specific licensing basis must be maintained during the renewal terms in the same manner and to the same extent as during the original licensing term. License renewal rule started in early or late 80s, early 90s, and the rule was uh, put together in 1991. It was revised in 1995, and subsequently God report revision one was issued in 2001. <clears throat> it was then revised in 2005 with a lot of effort to update the aging lesson then and also REF2 was issued in 2010. Tremendous amount of work went through that revision. In 2012, industry identified, uh, informed NRC the intent to submit subsequent license renewal. The status of license renewal, as John mentioned it, is 73 units have been relicensed 18 units currently under review, and eight upcoming applications between 2014 and 2018. There are some plants that have ceased operation due to different reasons. One of them is Crystal River, one of them is Kwani, and two units of Song, Unit 2 and 3. John has already presented this in his presentation with the update, but this is 2012 data. 15 reactors are greater than 40 years, 50 reactors 30 to 39 years, 37 reactors 20 to 29 years, and two reactors 10 to 9 years. <clears throat> there is a lot of industry activity supporting license renewal application preparation. Nuclear Energy Institute, NEI, organizes working group and technical committees to address generic technical and process issues and to develop additional guidelines for preparation of license renewal application. Others are Babcock Wilcock that generated four generic AG management reports, Westinghouse, five AG management reports, and General Electric, two generic technical reports. Arriva also been actively supported NEI, NRC, and license renewal, and NRC uh, in license renewal initiative from the inception to date, and supported up to 50% of the license renewal application approved by NRC today. Almost all of the generic technical report has support of NEI, EPRI, DOE, and if needed, and with the endorsement of the NRC. NEI license renewal task force are, is one of the groups supporting license renewal applications. They meet regularly, it's just quarterly, and also meet with NRC management quarterly too. They support the SRP goal and other revision of the revision recommendations. NEI license renewal task force also was behind uh, preparation of the NEI 9510 industry guideline. 
and in the CPA reviews of the application, if applicant request for one to be done on their application. NAI license renewal also, license renewal working groups are the one also supporting license renewal initiative. Mechanical working group, in addition to every reviews and recommendation, they are uh, upkeeping, doing upkeeping the, of the pre-mechanical tools. Electrical working group, Electrical working group, in addition to other activities, also keeping update of the FE electrical tools. Civil structural working group is another group that uh, discipline related, and in addition to keeping the update of the structural tool, working on the recommendation and changes to the existing rule. Implementation working group is a new group that has been formed and they supported NRC IP 7103 and industry guideline related to implementation of the license renewal application. Another new group is subsequent license renewal working group that is working on the uh, LTO and R&D and license renewal guidance for subsequent license renewal. <coughs> ASME and special working group working on nuclear plant age management in general within the, uh, among a lot of other things that they are doing. Electrical Power Research Institute, in addition to supporting the license renewal tools, there are major activities that what comes to mind are going to be similar to BWR VIP, BWR and BWR water chemistry, flow accelerator correlation, and good boarding practices document. It should be noted that majority of the GAL programs or generic aging lesson learns are using some of the EPRI generated technical document for those programs. <clears throat> Partnering between EPRI and DOE on, long, on light water sustainability program sponsored researches provides the technical foundation for licensing and managing the long-term safe and economical operation of the current nuclear power plant. Additionally, Idaho National Lab serves as a technical integration office and coordinates the research and development projects in the following area. Material aging and degradation, advanced instrumentation information, and control system technologies, risk-informed safety margin characterization, and advanced light water reactor nuclear fuels. Typical license renewal project has five phases. It, is, it costs approximately 16 to 25 million and it takes four to six years. We have defined the process with predictability and transparency this is reliable and creates a more effective and effective process for preparing the license renewal application. The license renewal five phases, phase one include project definition, project instruction development, and project familiarization, and pilot program implementation. Phase two is technical evaluation. As a part of phase two, also evaluating environmental, preparing environmental report that includes evaluation of severe accident mitigation alternative or SAMA. Phase three is preparation of the license renewal application that I would go in detail further present, further the slides. And phase four is NRC review and approval of the LRA. Phase five is implementation of the commitment following issuance of the renewed operating license. These are the highlights of the regulatory and industry guideline used for license renewal. They are including NRC rules 10 CFR 54 and 51 
NRC guidelines such as RIGI 1.188 and ISG interim staff guideline as John mentioned. NRC reports include new RIG 1800, new RIG 1801, which is generic aging lesson learned, and new RIG 1551, 1555, which is SRP for the ER. NEI guidelines include NEI 9510, NEI 9806, and NEI 0501. Industry guidelines include EPRI, all of the EPRI documents in support of the programs and the EPRI is structural, mechanical, and electrical tools. Element of an integration plan assessment, or IPA, for license renewal includes a scoping, a screening, aging management reviews. A scoping, as John also mentioned to it, it refers to a scoping of safety-related equipment, non-safety affecting safety, and regulated events. Regulated events include fire protection, environmental qualification, pressurized thermal shock, anticipated transient without scrum, and station blackout. License renewal process, in addition to a scoping, a screening, and aging management reviews, also include time-limited aging analysis and environmental report. Documentation prepared in supporting those phase of the project would roll up into preparation of the license renewal application. License renewal application has four sections, including at section one, administrative, Section two, scoping and screening. Section three, aging management reviews. And section four, time-limited aging analysis and exemptions. <coughs> Application also has five appendices. Appendix, Appendix A is FSCR supp supplement. Appendix B is aging management programs. Appendix C is applicant action items. And Appendix D is technical specification changes if required, and Appendix C is supplement to the environmental report. NRC process is a proven successful process. It takes 22 to 30 months, and as it shows in there, please note that it gives public five opportunity to interact. Those are highlighted in yellow. It focuses on engaging the public in the process. A typical license renewal project organization includes project management, which include project manager, project engineer, administrative support, and uh, matrix support. The key leads on the project organization are the civil structure, mechanical, electrical, TLA, and also environmental and SAMA leads, which they are discipline leads. <coughs> License renewal project involves consideration and review of entire plan design basis and current licensing basis as part of uh, 54 criteria. In performing license renewal scoping, uh, scoping determination. Therefore, I believe it's important when you organize in the project organization, have seasoned, familiarized people with the plan on those positions to make the process more successful. The mixes that we have choose in U.S. or we have experience in U.S. in preparing the license renewal organization are collaborative unit utility and cons consulting uh, form, which in that form 
A consulting firm prepared the basis for the preparation of the application and the application and put it in the review and approval process for the owners and acceptance reviews. The other form of organization is utility manager scope of task. It should be noted that the first one that I mentioned also, we call it as a managed task or full scope work. The second one is utility manager scope, which utility, utility takes charge. And usually they hire a staffing as a time and material basis to support preparation of the application and the basis for it. A mixed project organization is a combination of one and two, with some utilities choose be between uh, preparing some section of the application by giving it as a managed task to a consulting organization based on the needs, or uh, extracting some as part of the project, like a scoping and a screening and contracting it out to the consultant. Advantage, advantages of the first, first form or collaborative methods are having in your organization a proven experience, an industry working group experience, and continuous improvement that you gain through hiring a consultant with experience that been from the initial time of the license renewal application. I'm in the process of license renewal application. And also, industry best practices by bringing the recent learns from previous applications. A typical resource requirement is presented in this slide. And as you see, the staffing peaks during the phase two of the project, and it ramps down through phase three and four of the project. In conclusion, NRC regulatory structure allows for a safe and environmentally reasonable long-term operation of the U.S. nuclear power plants. Continuous improvement of the aging management activity must be maintained based on the lesson learned and operating experience. And also, industry activity involvement in development of the effort led by NEI, NRC, EPRI, DOE, and consulting companies are essential to supporting and maintaining the operation of the long operation of the nuclear power plant. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward for answering the question. Thank you very much, Masood, for that, effect, that uh, perspective. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Sherry Bernhoff. She's the program manager for long-term operations within the Electric Power Research Institute's nuclear sector. She's responsible for all the strategic planning and the activities related there, too. It's my pleasure to introduce Sherry. Hi. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I always enjoy coming to Paris. I, I had the opportunity, I get to work with EDF quite a bit in my role. So I get to go over here a couple times a year and I appreciate this opportunity, this invitation. But there is one person that's a lot happier than I am this week. And I have a university aged son. And while we're here, he's on a university break and he's out on a wine tasting tour. So <laughs> I don't know what's up with that, but he's gonna have a good time. So a little bit about EPRI and then some about the work that EPRI does to support the aging management programs that you've heard quite a bit about that really serves a foundation for the industry, the utility members to make their decisions to continue the life of their plants and also to help support the regulatory process. Okay, so about EPRI. It's about 40 years old. It is a nonprofit organization. Even though we are funded by our utility members, it's very important to us that our research, our research results are very independent. So we need to, we, we are very conscientious of, of making sure we have that divide, that we still have the independence and the research results. But we do have utility members and advisors that help us with the prioritization and the necessity of the research to support their needs. Uh, 
We do a lot of collaboration. Like I said, EDF is one of our big collaborators. Uh, Materials Aging Institute is uh, co-funded with EDF and EPRI and other utilities throughout the world. And we also work quite a bit through the Asian sector and several U uh, European members. Uh, most of our offices are located in the United States, but we do have managers in each of the countries. What this shows is uh, we are growing, especially from a nuclear perspective. A hundred of, or I should say a hundred percent, and also a hundred by, by counts today, of the reactors in the United States are full members of the EPRI program. We are growing quite a bit in the international sector, and we want to keep growing in the international sector. We have over 200 or 20 countries that are members of EPRI, and that represents now every technology type is within the EPRI research program. John talked earlier about uh, the expanded materials degradation matrix. What we have done with EPRI is we have developed what we call the, the materials degradation matrix, or the MDM for those that may be familiar with our products. We put in there all of the material types, we rank their susceptibility to aging, and we start identifying what issues we have to close the gaps for aging management. We now have, of course, the PWRs, the BWRs, the can-do designs, and we are in the process right now of including all the VVR materials in that material degradation matrix so that we'll have a comprehensive listing of materials in the RCS system subject to aging and degradation. Within our nuclear sector, we have four major sectors within EPRI. Nuclear is its entire sector. It's one of our largest sectors. We have the, some of the most research dollars come into the nuclear area. We have three core drivers. If you see the bottom one, why we're here today, it is for sustained long-term operations. So I want to talk just about our long-term operations programs. As Don introduced, I'm responsible for that program, but it's a very collaborative effort. I leverage off of the resources and the talent all across EPRI and our international members and the U.S. Department of Energy as we, do our, as we plan our research programs for long-term operations. Uh, the program started in 2009 in response to a number of utilities in the U.S. approaching the Department of Energy and the NRC saying, we want to talk about extending beyond the 60 years of operations. What would be the tools and necessary aspects to do that? Uh, we talked some about the NRC's role. We talked about the role of the Nuclear Energy Institute, which is to help organize the utilities to understand the regulatory process. And then EPRI's role comes in to help with formulating the, the sound technical basis to ensure safe reliable long-term operations. That's our number one goal, is pulling together that technical basis for the safety of the plants. Our number two goal with our program is to look at demonstration of the tools and the techniques. We have quite a few inspection techniques, pulling together the aspects of our non-destructive examination group, our chemistry, all of those programs we have throughout EPRI, integrating them so that the, the tools and the aging management programs can be effectively implemented. John talked about that. That's very important that we support that effective implementation as well. And of course, the third thing we look at is how much we can draw on international experience for the collaboration and coordination of that work. So those are the three main goals of the program that we have that I manage. The next couple overheads, I'm going to be talking about some of the specific technical aspects of our programs. I have day's worth of information consolidated on a few slides. So I will try and get through, but I'm available for questions during breaks if you have any specific technical questions. We have three major focus areas for the research for long-term operations. The first, which is the largest area, is those research programs that help answer the questions for support of the aging management programs. And these align very closely to what John talked about earlier. We see the needs for the RCS system materials, welds and piping, the reactor pressure vessel, the electrical cables, the concrete systems, containment structures. We're also very concerned about buried pipes, buried commodities, uh, service coatings, 
Those are the key aspects for the aging management program, so we have research going on on those. We also look at areas if the plants are going to continue to operate for a longer period of time. What are areas within the plants that, within the U.S. scope of the regulations, don't fall into the passive long-lived components, but certainly from the owner-operator standpoint, they would need to look at modernizing for that continued period of operation. And of course, key among those are the instrumentation control systems, uh, tools and technologies for online monitoring for diagnostics and prognostics of systems. And we're also doing a lot of work on updating the thermal hydraulic codes and the risk assessment tools and technologies as well. Another area that we stay closely tied to is what supports the social political climate and some of those have to do with compliance with clean energy standards, long-term storage of used fuel, and looking at ways to better utilize water. You know, with droughts going on, water usage increasing, how do we effectively look at long-term water usage? Just a comment on the, uh, the clean air energy standards. Uh, while nuclear in the United States represents less than 20% of the total generation, it's very important that we focus on extending the life of the power plants in the United States because you can see that it contributes greater than 60% of the non-carbon emitting generation. We do have a growth or an increase in renewables, primarily wind and solar in the United States, but right now it's less than 1% contribution from some of those renewables. And even by 2013, or I'm sorry, 2015 to 2016, uh, we're still looking at a, a peak of probably about 4% contribution from renewables. Several states have goals and targets out to like 2020, 2025 to get up to closer to 10%. But for this interim time period, it's very important that we continue to invest ensuring that we have the safe, reliable, continued operation of the nuclear fleet for the U.S. for the non-carbon emitting generating source. Okay, turning a little bit more, oh good, I'm keeping it. Turning a little bit more to now some of the technical aspects of my talk. Um, aging management programs, I'm not sure, in, in the United States we call this a classic bathtub curve. You know, Early in component life, you do get some early failures. Some of them are installations, some of them are just not a you know, reliable component. So you get, you get some early life failures, and then your hope or your desire is that the majority of the component life is spent on the flat part of the curve. But the thing that's really interesting in, in as we talk about long-term operations, is what happens out there on the tail end of the curve. So the questions we need to answer for long-term operations, and the majority, even though the majority of your plant life is hopefully in the flat part of the curve, the majority of our research and attention goes to the tail end of the curve. We spend a lot of research dollars understanding when. We're gonna start to see the upward trend for failures, how you're gonna detect, how you're gonna manage, what is the safety limit when you start to see that upward trend in failures, when do you just have to repair or replace? And also, are there mitigative actions that we can take to slow the rate of that trend and continue to get a few more service years of life out of that component? And some of those mitigation measures are weld repairs, peening for stress relief, chemistry changes. So we have a lot of research going in all those areas. Prediction, the inspection, the management, the safety evaluations, and mitigative measures that really focuses our research. Turning now to the first uh, highest priority topic that we talk about for research, and that is the whole question of the RCS metals. Core internals, they do have a threshold stress. You know, your exposure levels are gonna be increased temperature, increased fluence, and to some degree, increased fatigue cycles on the components. So we're looking at such questions about what are the threshold stresses, reduction in fracture property toughnesses, and increases in void swelling. What could that do to the structural integrity of your, um, of your core internals? We look at the periphery materials, probably for the first 30, 40 years of operations, 
your periphery materials may not need to be evaluated. As we turn to the question of continued exposure to radiation influence, do you have to take into account what's happening to your periphery materials just outside of your vessel, especially your cast off synthetic stainless steels that are a lot of your, um, your pipe configurations? We also look at increases in fatigue usage. We do have fatigue calculational models that are, we know right now, overly conservative, but as we start looking at the 40 to 60 years, do we need to be changing that, those models? And then looking at the environmental effects on the proper, or the fracture toughness properties too. We do know that the shift starts to occur. So how are we addressing that? Within EPRI and collaborating with some of our research problems partners, we do have over $50 million a year going into the RCS metals to address all of these different aspects. With regard to the core internals materials, we have harvested core internal materials from the Zarita plant, which is recited in Spain. We are working on a project right now to irradiate those core materials to a higher irradiation fluence level so we can start evaluating their fracture toughness and the void swelling characteristics on that. Uh, we are mocking up some additional fatigue samples to do some, some cyclical fatigue on those in, in the environmental conditions, you know, with the water exposure. The earlier fatigue samples were done in a dry environment. We're doing them in the wetted environment. And we're also doing it more characteristic of actual plant operating conditions so that we can start demonstrating the technical basis for extending the fatigue life on the primary system components. Those are just some examples of some of the work that we have going on in this area. We had talked about the Gall report. Within the Gall report, we, we did a mapping of all the EPRI research to the Gall report, which also translates to the, the iGall, and there are close to 200 EPRI products that are referenced in the Gall report, and by reference also translated to the, the iGall report. We keep those up to date with our different advisors and research committees. Um, they're updated based on research results, inspection results, operating experience, and input from our advisory council. Okay, turning to the reactor pressure vessel, we talked about this as the, uh, you know, the next possible consideration for aging management. When we do our work on the reactor pressure vessel, of course, a lot of it is with concern to the regulatory position and the safety position. Uh, we know that there is a shift in embrittlement trends as you increase neutron exposure or neutron flux to the reactor vessel materials. They do start to show a decrease in their, their fracture toughness properties. So one of it is, of course, to, to provide this, the safety basis for the regulator, but a lot of this also is to help the plant operator owner understand what the ultimate life of their reactor pressure vessel could be before they make a financial decision to pursue extending their license as well. So it really serves both communities. We do this right now, we've got quite a bit of um, representative materials in test reactors at a higher fluence level, we're collecting that data, and we're also continuing to work with all the utilities in the United States to reintroduce surveillance capsules in higher fluence leading locations so we can start to get fluence, actual in-vessel fluence data representative of out to 80 years of operations. So we have that project going on. We actually have two projects going on right now, working with the uh, utilities in the United States to reintroduce some surveillance capsule data. Another area we have quite a bit of research going on is the area of electrical cables. Again, this is a concern, of course, for the, the regulator. As, as John said, they do have to have a qualified life. We have to show that there's reasonable assurance that the, the cable can operate all through its lifetime and then be able to sustain a, the conditions of an accident and be able to continue to fulfill its safety mission. That's the EQ qualified life that John talked about. And then again, cables are very ex expensive, very extensive. Our members have, are asking us to help us quantify if they want to continue to extend the license of their plant, how, many, how much of the cable system may they or may not have to replace. That could be one of their decisions of, with regard to the economics for extending the license. So we're doing quite a bit of work. Uh, typically, we found that cables in a normal temperature, chemical exposure environment, the, the performance of cables is very good. 
We also collect a lot of data from our fossil plants that have over 100 years of operation on some of these cable systems. Again, in those, those very normal, benign environments, cable performance is good, but that's not what we're in all the time. We have uh, submerged cables, we have cables exposed to radiation, to temperature, to different uh, chemicals. The top picture, this shows what you can do environmentally to your plant. This was a cable tray. Somebody put a modification into the plant. They put a high temperature uh, valve right near a cable tray and did not properly insulate that valve. They came in the next outage and this was a condition of their cables. So it's very important to do the inspections and the monitoring of the cables. EPRI has published several guidelines on how to do the inspections and the monitoring of the cables, but this is, this is one example where you need to pay attention to your plant and do the walk down and look for these vulnerable locations throughout your plant. We have uh, good, good collaboration and coordination on cable research right now. Um, the NRC is funding some of this work, Department of Energy and EPRI. We have a lot of work going on right now at Sandia National Labs. Uh, New Mexico is one of the national labs where we are doing a lot of accelerated aging in high temperature and high radiation fields on cable and cable insulation materials. Okay, moving on to the next area, concrete and containment structures. Uh, I think for a lot, a lot of us and for a lot of years, people made somewhat or somewhat comfortable with the fact that concrete's everywhere. I mean, concrete's been around since the Romans. Concrete's performed. What we're finding now is we, again, turn to the question of continuing to extend the license of the plant out beyond the 60 years. We do need to really understand the performance of concrete, its changes in mechanical properties, compressive strengths, uh, failures when you start talking about irradiation levels and also gamma heating. So we're doing, we have quite a few exper or research projects designed working in coordination with the Department of Energy at the Oak Ridge National Labs. These next couple years we're going to be taking concrete samples and exposing them to the conditions of what we'd expect the fluence levels to be out at 80 years, and also the gamma heating that we expect that it'll accumulate over that lifetime. We've done an extensive amount of literature survey on concrete. It suggests as you get out towards the fluence levels that you'll see between 80 and 100 years, you, you do start to see a knee and a curve where you get dis um, a drop off in the compressive properties. And how this relates to the nuclear plants is, especially with the PWRs, you look at the biological shield wall and the support structure for the, uh, the reactor vessel. So we want to take that data, then we want to start doing the structural analysis of how that could possibly impact the biological shield walls and the support structures for the PWR vessels. Uh, we're also doing quite a bit of work on the, um, there, there are several spent fuel pools that do have boric acid leaks and corrosions. We're doing some uh, modeling right now on the impacts that that will have on the spent fuel pool and the rebar structure. And we're also doing quite a bit of work on possible changes in creep fatigue and looking at other environmental stressors on the containment and the concrete structures. So shifting now from some of the work that we're doing on the aging management programs, uh, let's talk just one example of where we're looking at some modernization. And that is again with the instrument computation and control systems. They're extensive in the plants. As they know, you know, technology is constantly changing the INC area. It's very exciting, but it's very hard for a plant operator to keep up. So we work really at kind of three areas. We, we help focus on what type of changes in the INC system can really provide some productivity enhancements how they can replace with the constant changes, you know, how you keep a common architecture, how you can keep things consistent for your maintenance people, your, your control room operators, and then if you do have some of the aging equipment, the best technologies for maintaining it, you know, whether it's uh, some reverse engineering or um, practices to extend that life. So we do recognize that as architectures and there's a constant change in the INC world that we really do need to help people out understanding how you keep things for the, the maintenance technicians and the operators so that they can stay up. 
Another area that was also, I think, touched on the IAEA, which was very interesting, is we have a large project that we've just started last year on what we call centralized online monitoring for asset management. We, we go out and we monitor, we have demonstration projects right now at two plants. One, we've completely monitored an instrument, an emergency diesel generator, and another plant, we've done a detailed instrumentation and monitoring of their step-up transformer. They're example plants. Uh, so we take the data that we get from continuous online monitoring. We use what we call advanced pattern recognition systems. We model what we expect the behavior to be. We gather the data on all the changes and transients that are coming in. We have over 20, 20 data points that we collect throughout like off-gassing you know, on, a, on the transformer. And in real time, we're always comparing the expected response to what we're seeing coming in as the actual conditions. And we can look at that, if there's any deviation between the expected behavior and the actual behavior, and it will automatically kick out an email to the system engineer and then alert the operator that there's something going on right now. That's the first stage of this project that we've worked on right now. We've demonstrated that that works. Our next stage we want to use, we want to start using that information and feedback into algorithms to help us determine what the remaining useful life is going to be on those components. It's a very exciting area of research that we've just started on. So this just gives you a ver very quick sample of some of the work that we're doing for the aging management programs and a couple areas that we're looking at as the plants continue to operate how we help them to maintain the plants from the INC systems, and one tool that we're looking at for the advances in the diagnostics and the prognostics for the, for the plants. So with that, we feel as the plants actually start going into this application process that John talked about to, to start putting together their basis for subsequent license renewal, we feel from what we've seen with the research that we don't see what we're calling any showstoppers. We haven't found that technical issue yet that we said this component or this plant, you know, is not going to be able to make the safety argument for extending their license. There may be some plant specific issues. There could be some older vessels that may have some issues with the embrittlement trend correlations or some of their cast off genetic stainless steel components they may have to replace. But on a very generic basis, we have not seen any of those technical life-limiting issues coming up. But with that, we are going to continue the research and continue our support, and we will be continue with the publication of the EPRI documents that provide that technical basis. <laughs> I have no time. Thank you, Sherry. Our next speaker is Dr. Ann Visconti. She's the president, <coughs> excuse me, Visconti Research. <coughs> Goodness, she conducts public opinions and communication surveys and research on a complete range of nuclear energy topics, and she's going to speak specifically to license renewal and subsequent license renewal. Ann? Well, I too am delighted to be here in Paris especially with your wonderful weather and your beautiful, beautiful trees in bloom. It's wonderful compared to Washington, D.C. We're covered with snow. Uh, so for the lessons uh, from public opinion and communications research on license renewal in the United States, I'm going to take us back 25 years. In the early 1990s, the conventional wisdom was that license renewal for nuclear power plants was going to be extremely difficult, impossible. The opinion was generally that the public would be opposed, and therefore it would be much too difficult. No electric utility wanted to be the first one to try this difficult process. However, the industry wanted to prepare. So the industry put together a team to look at the technical and regulatory issues, the political issues, and the communications concerns. And as a part of this, 
I did public opinion research to find out how the public might receive license renewal and under what conditions and how do you communicate on this subject. Well, the research was quite surprising. In fact, most of the people interviewed actually supported license renewal. They saw it as kind of like renewing a driver's license, a normal process. And they liked the idea that license renewal meant that nuclear power plants would be inspected. Because for most of the US public, they didn't know that nuclear power plants are ever inspected. In fact, in our country, as I suppose in most countries, nuclear power plants are monitored and inspected every single day. But again, the public didn't know that. But there was a caution in this, and that is, when we mention the idea of license renewal for 20 years, the public became concerned. How can we know if the plant will be safe for 20 years? 20 years is much too long to go without another inspection. In the context of communicating about the subject as normal, take a look at some of these terms. My goodness, I am not a nuclear scientist or engineer, but I have been associated with this industry for 30 years, and I believe you are the smartest people I know, literally the smartest people I know. How in the world did you come up with these terms? Think of what this conveys. You have these old plants on life support. Can we come up with license renewal? In the United States, we actually did come up with license renewal as an alternative for life, life extension. And I thought there was a complete and total stop to life extension as a term. But it's been creeping back in. Aging. Why don't we talk about what we're aiming for, which is continuous safety, long-term safety. Let's think about the terminology. Materials degradation. Are we talking about long-term safety of materials? Talking to each other internally is fine, except for the fact that the language we use internally is the language that eventually gets pushed out to the public who either don't understand or they get ideas that are totally different from what you want to convey. So, we also found that citizens have quite a nuanced perspective. They don't have a lot of knowledge of the subject, obviously, but they do have an intelligent approach to the subject. So you ask them, do you support license renewal for this plant? The answer is, I don't know. Why do you suppose that is? Because they're not experts. They want the experts to decide. So you ask, do you support the utility seeking license renewal for this plant? And the answer is yes. You ask the question, do you support license renewal for this plant as long as it meets government safety standards? And the answer is yes. So the individual is leaving this conclusion about whether the plant is safe, not to themselves, but to the technical experts who have the ability to determine if the plant is safe. Over the past 10 years, we have asked of the general public this question, do you strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, or strongly disagree that when their original operating license expires, we should renew the license of nuclear power plants that continue to meet federal safety standards? This is part of a, a longer series of questions. 
Well, the dark green is those who strongly agree, and the light green is those who somewhat agree, and the little bitty margin at the bottom is those who disagree. So you can see about 80% of the general US public agreeing with the concept of renewing the license of nuclear power plants that continue to meet federal safety standards. We also survey people who live near nuclear power plants. We started doing this in, in uh, 2005, and we do it every other year on a biennial basis. We survey people living within the 10-mile radius of all of the U.S. nuclear power plants, excluding those people whose families, someone in the family works at a nuclear power plant who might obviously have a vested interest. We ask the same question, and here you find 90% approximately who support the idea of license renewal for nuclear power plants that continue to meet federal safety standards. And here again, the strongly favor, strongly agree, is two-thirds. It's huge. Now, this, these research findings have been borne out in the real world in practice. Finally, one utility which at the time was called Baltimore Gas and Electric, did get up the courage to apply for license renewal, as we heard from John earlier. As part of the license renewal process, there was a public hearing. The utility had worked very carefully and very hard with the local community first before this hearing to make sure they understood what this was all about, what they were planning to do, and all about the safety process that would be involved before license renewal. So here is a report on how the meeting went. And this is a report from the local newspaper. This is what the local newspaper said. And by the way, the room was filled with many people nationally from national organizations who were not supportive of nuclear energy. So the local people were there, and a lot of national opponents were there as well. So here is what the newspaper said. We are sure some of the opponents to relicensing Calvert Cliff's nuclear power plant were left confused following a hearing last week. Critics of the utility and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission denounced the relicensing process as well as nuclear energy. Then what happened next was a little startling. Calvert Cliff's residents stood up and told them to leave their plant alone, that Baltimore Gas and Electric had been a good neighbor. And that's from the local newspaper. And as you heard earlier, since then, 73 licenses have been renewed. So, here are some good messages. And you've heard them before in what I've been talking about. But these are important points to make in talking about license renewal. When their license expires, we should renew the license of nuclear power plants that continue to meet government safety standards. No one, no one in the industry, no one outside the industry, wants license renewal for nuclear power plants that don't meet standards. Second, the Nuclear Regulatory Agency inspects each nuclear power plant every day. And third, at any time, before or after license renewal, if a nuclear power plant is not operating safely, the regula regulatory agency will shut it down. So this is not that you get a license and that means that you're not going to have any kind of inspections for the next 20 years. Every single day, if you're not operating safely, that plant will be shut down. We also tested um, in research, in a, quite a few different studies, but this is a summary, some charges that the critics typically make about license renewal and best ways to talk about, uh, to, to respond to those, those criticisms. 
Um, and here is one. Patching an aging plant is like putting retreads on bald tires. That's a very typical comment. Response. This plant has a good operating record because of continued vigorous maintenance, testing, and upgrading of parts all along the way. And at any time, if the plant is not operating safely, the nuclear regulator will shut it down. Another charge. No nuclear power plant has operated this long, so we really don't understand long-term aging. Best response? New technology has continuously been built into this plant, and improvements will continue to be made as technology advances. And at any time, if the plant is not operating safely, the regulator will shut it down. Another charge. The industry admits that the newest plant designs are safer, so why not just shut down the old ones? Response. Current and future generations benefit when we use our resources wisely. These plants are paid for and are operating safely and economically. And at any time, if the plant, etc. You know that one, you've heard it before. Charge. This is just a rubber stamp to keep operating for another 20 years. Response. The Independent Nuclear Regulatory Agency inspects and monitors each plant every day and at any time, and you've heard that. So, in conclusion, here are some implications from our research about next step or subsequent license renewal. Keep it simple, be positive, keep it normal. Keep the terminology, terminology that the public understands, focusing on safety and what you're aiming for, and make it no big deal. It's a continuation. Emphasize continuity. Continuous regulatory oversight, continuous plant improvements. We heard this morning from the head of the uh, Safety Regulatory Agency, you know, it's, is there a, the plant just gonna become suddenly not safe at the end of 40 years? Is it safe at 39 years and not safe at 40 years? This is a continuous process. Reassure the public that the plant's licenses are renewed only if they meet government safety standards and that if a plant is not operating safely, it will be shut down. And this goes without saying, no matter what the topic, Demonstrate safety through performance excellence. I know that's what you're all about, and uh, that, that's just so critically important. And then in terms of your local community, build local support over time so they understand their plant, they appreciate the good performance of the plant, the advantages that it provides, and they are there as the most ardent supporters. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. We were unfortunately unable to get anyone to come here at this time because our utilities are quite busy with all the activities of safely operating their facilities and continuing going through outages and whatnot. So they asked me to just give a quick understanding of what an owner-operator's perspective of this might be. I will just tell you that right now you've heard from a regulatory authority, from a commercial entity and organization which supports license renewal and all the studies and evaluations, from a research organization that provides a lot of the data and the information and the research necessary to assure the acceptability, and then from a communications organization which has done the research and the surveys to get some sense of the public's opinion. So what does an owner-operator believe? <clears throat> These nuclear power plants are assets and they're significant assets. Many of them took as much as six to eight years to construct and license, and at the cost of several hundred million dollars, if not a billion dollars, depending upon the time, time frame in which they were actually constructed and licensed. 
And then since then, there has been everyday inspection, maintenance, activities to ensure they continue to meet the highest levels of safety, activities to ensure they meet the highest levels of NRC requirements, and then all the activities related to the continuation of best practices and information sharing from all the nuclear facilities, both in the United States and globally. And then even in the post-Fukushima Daiichi activity, each one of the nuclear power plants in the United States, working collectively as one entity, if you will, will spend well over $4 billion on the activities to enhance and improve. So essentially well over 40 to $50 million per nuclear power plant will be spent to integrate safety enhancements and improvements in a post-Fukushima Daiichi situation. So through all the studies, all the evaluations, all the safe operation, why would you, at the end of a stated period of 40 years in our accordance with our Atomic Energy Act, not extend the license of this facility if you had demonstrated the capability to continue to safely operate it. Now, obviously, the economics come into play, but the primary issue is safety. All of the owner-operators in the United States, and I'm sure throughout the world, feel that the primary motive for operating a nuclear power facility has to be safety. Safety has to be prim premier, has to be first. But it is, in, in many cases, an activity that is indeed a business. So the economics do play a role. So when you look at the economics of this, it makes no sense to go through and to design, construct, license, and then operate a generation three or beyond nuclear facility if the generation two or generation two plus facility with all the enhancements and improvements that have already occurred are adequate to demonstrate the capability to continue to be safely operated in both, as I stated, a safety and an economic fashion. So the owner operators in the United States, as I'm sure EDF here in France, is acknowledging and recognizing that these facilities have been operated safely, have been enhanced and improved, have had technological improvements incorporated in them, have kept up with the industry standards and the best practices, have continued to be inspected on a daily basis and beyond in all of their operational aspects. So, with that in mind, our owners and operators are looking forward to continuing to extend the operating life of their nuclear facilities, provided that those nuclear facilities, indeed, as Ann said, continue to meet all the standards, the standards that are established through the research by EPRI, the standards that are acknowledged and established through regulatory assessments by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So we in the nuclear power industry in the United States acknowledge and recognize that that is a necessary activity for us to conduct. We also recognize that it's important to note that in 50 of our, we have 50 states in the United States. In 31 of those 50 states, nuclear energy is utilized. In seven of those states, greater than 50% of the energy in that state is provided by nuclear energy. In each of those states where each of the, and I'll use the term just for simplicity, 100 nuclear power plants. For the 100 nuclear power plants located throughout those 31 states, each one of those nuclear power plants provides 700 to 1,000 jobs at 50% greater than the state average of salary. Each one of those nuclear power plants provides 29 to $35 million a year in local infrastructure support, hospitals, schools, police, and other support mechanisms. Each one of those nuclear power plants provides greater than $250 million in state infrastructure and in economic support. And each one of those nuclear power plants provides $69 million on average in federal income taxes. If you take that onto account, that these plants provide available, affordable, reliable base load energy that's environmentally friendly, that produces jobs, produces economy, enhances and improves the state's activities and economy, and enhances and improves the federal states and economy, and continues to contribute greater than 60% of our non-carbon producing <clears throat> energy format, it seems only logical that nuclear must be a part of the mix. So we in the nuclear power industry don't expect 
our government to make nuclear the only energy source. We just only believe it must be a significant contributor for us to continue to meet the, our responsibilities related to carbon production, to clean air energy standards, and to ensuring that we have, again, available, reliable, affordable, environmentally safe energy. So each of our owner operators in the United States are expecting to continue with that. They're all monitoring the processes that you've heard. They're all looking at these activities. I didn't know they were going to put that up. Um, you can just go back to the general. That's why I'm just not speaking to it now. Because essentially the presentation I put together is a summary of the owner and operator's perspective, which has really already been addressed more than adequately by our four panelists, recognizing and acknowledging what has all been done to this. Now, before we open it to questions, I'd like to say that it's important for you to note that in our country, we take very seriously everything we do related to nuclear energy. Our nuclear science technology professionals are serious about what they do. They believe in what they do. They're passionate about the science and technology. They are indeed passionate and believe in it. They don't do it for a job. They do it because they believe it contributes to their economy, to the environment, and to the public today and contributes to the well-being of the generations to come. We're sure the vast majority of you feel exactly the same way. And that's why we believe in the United States that we want to work with you to share the lessons we have learned, the information we have gained, and the activities we've conducted to facilitate a process that enables not just France, but any country in the world that acknowledges and recognizes the need to consider long-term operation plant life extension, license renewal, whatever you call it, notwithstanding Ann's comments. Um, <laughs> it's important to note that. If you step back and look many years ago, think about it. What was the life expectancy of humankind? At one time, it was no more than 40 years. So I'm happy to acknowledge that nobody said I had to shut down at 40 years, that I could go beyond that. And I guess that's because of medicine and other technological advances that have enabled us all to live much longer, much more fruitful, much more bountiful lives. Well, it's a somewhat the same thing. Technology has contributed to the ability of our nuclear power facilities to reevaluate materials, reevaluate performance of components, reevaluate the impacts of gamma, of heat, of neutron embrittlement, to ensure that we have the technology, the capability to assess what the impacts have been, and to ensure that we put in place aging management processes and procedures to inspect and maintain all of the component, components accordingly. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions and please ask you to identify yourself, the organization you represent, and then ask your question. And ask your question, you may ask it to an individual panelist or to the entire panel as a whole, and then they will answer it accordingly. Now, given the fact that we did not come equipped here from the United States with the capability to speak the lovely French language, I would ask you to ask the question in English if you are able. If you are not, we will have to put on these headphones to be able to understand the translation. So with that, I open it to questions, ladies and gentlemen. Do you hear me? You can, yes. Oh, my name is uh, Jean-Michel Moroni. I work for Electricité de France. And I have a question uh, for Mr. Lubinsky. Uh, as Mr. Chevet said this morning, uh, our philosophy in France and in Europe is to modify the design basis of uh, operating nu nuclear power plants every 10 years, given the lessons drawn from the operating experience but also uh, improvements in knowledge and technologies and, uh, in a certain way, uh, expectancies of uh, stakeholders. Uh, my question is, after, particularly after the Fukushima Daiichi accident, is uh, NRC moving from its uh, historical position and uh, setting, uh, setting up a process more or less similar to the European one for existing plants in the US? Thank you for the question. Excuse me. Um, actually, not surprised the question was coming after the comment this morning. Uh, let me start with uh, a 
Yeah, I could probably go on for an hour with a response, but I'll try to be uh, as brief as I can. But a couple things that came up this morning in the discussion was that the safety improvements and in continuing to improve safety was based on state-of-the-art knowledge. And I just want to say, we look at that differently. State-of-the-art knowledge is not just with improving safety. When you look at state-of-the-art knowledge, it's an analysis of the current plant conditions. What you find many times when you're using state-of-the-art knowledge is that there is a lot of conservatism already built into the plant designs, the licensing basis, and the design basis. You may find at other times with that knowledge that it actually shows that maybe there was not as much conservatism. And I would say that in responding to Fukushima, that's where you found there was not as much conservatism. The NRC's approach is not to wait until a license renewal period, not wait until the current license gets to its expiration date before having that done. So instead, we looked at it from the standpoint of Fukushima and, and did a lessons learned task force. It uh, put together a set of lessons learned to evaluate and requires the plants now to do those reevaluations rather than wait until subsequent license renewal. It would either validate that the plant is currently operating safely today as is expected. It may show that there are conservatisms based on that state of the art knowledge, state of the art knowledge or it may state that additional changes are needed. We've done that through issuance of orders to licensees to look at different aspects, whether it's their spent fuel pools, the instrumentation in the pools, or whether it's the mitigating strategies if a severe accident were to occur at the site. We've also asked them to relook at and analyze their flooding and seismic issues and to tell us what actions they are gonna take in response to those and we're currently evaluating those. So from the standpoint of requiring a periodic review every 10 years or as part of the license renewal where they do a full complete reassessment and modify their licensing basis, we are not considering it that, that at this time. As I said, part of subsequent license renewal, a paper is with the commission right now that has not been proposed to the commission. If the commission were to give a different direction, uh, we would of course would implement that. Implement that. But I do wanna add that our philosophy is based on the fact that we continually review and licensees continually review the safety of their plants. They've made changes along the way during the first 40 years. They did not wait till 40 years to make those changes. Some were because we required them, whether it's through an order or additional rulemaking. Others they may have decided on their own. When you look at the replacement of steam generators in plants, they, it was because of inspection requirements that showed they needed to replace the generators. But the ones they put in were more robust. They didn't just put in the exact same generator. They had a more robust generator. When they're looking at making improvements, whether it's a power upgrade to a plant or other changes to the plant that require equipment changes, they're putting equipment in that is more robust based on the lessons learned they have away, along the way. So they're making safety improvements along the way. Some are mandated by the NRC, some are voluntary. In either case, when they get to the license renewal period, that is their new licensing basis, and we expect them to continue to meet that and make any changes as they go into license renewal. I hope that answers your question. I have a question to Sherry. I think you mentioned that uh, in April you're doing a lot of work for other uh, power generating industries as well. I understand you mentioned that some of our industries are operating 80 to 100 years already. So what have been the lessons learned? And besides the radiation, is a nuclear plant that different finally than uh, the other plants with regards to these processes? Yes. Thank you. I, I mentioned during the presentation that we also support in the United States the, um, the fossil generation plants. The coal and you know, the gas plants are also under EPRI. Uh, we look to them with regard to cable experience. We did quite a bit of that. We look to them with regard to upgrades to instrumentation and control systems, you know, modeling how they went through mo changing out their control rooms. We've worked with them on some operator training issues as you modernize your control systems, the type of considerations that you have to go through to help your operators get used to modernizing the control room. Uh, some of the materials issues, uh, they have very high temperatures, but we do gather the high temperature data that we work with them, and they go through quite a few fatigue cycles 
on a coal plant, you know, much more than the, the nuclear plants that we go through. So as we're modeling our future generations for fatigue cycles, we're, we're dealing with our fossil counterparts on how to best model fatigue cycles. So we, we do gather that information. Does that help answer your question? It's, it's, it's not different from a secondary side of the plant. Uh, and I should say also from a chemistry standpoint, for like the turbines and the MSRs, we do a lot of uh, coordinated work. From, so from a secondary side of the plant, we find a lot of similarities. Of course, the primary side of the plant, you know, there are, there are differences. Thank you. Um, I will have no problem in speaking in American English. My, my name is Anne McLaughlin, and I was, uh, for 30 years, I was uh, head of the, I was European Bureau Chief for Platt's uh, nuclear publications, including Nucleonics Week, and now I'm an independent journalist. Uh, my question goes to Anne Bisconti. You presented some very interesting um, results about opinion uh, opinion uh, of, uh, you, uh, in the United States about long-term operation. Uh, and I, I wondered, uh, when, when we uh, heard Dr. Bichkov, we saw that there were quite a few different uh, approaches, and some people use the U.S. approach, some countries use the U.S. approach, some countries will use uh, a different approach uh, between five and uh, 15 or 20 years. So. Uh, but there, it, some of it is really different in nature, and you know, we heard uh, you say, well, in the United States, it's really no big deal, uh, even to go to 40 years, or pr maybe even to go to uh, past, um, uh, sorry, to go to 60 years, and even to go past 60 years. Uh, Pierre Franck Chauvet gave us the impression that it will be a big deal, even post 40. So my question is, do you think that the regulatory and even political context. I mean, in France, when the president gets involved, that's a big deal <laughs> uh, in long-term operation. Do you think that the regulatory context itself uh, can influence public opinion? Can you hear me? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, let me just clarify a couple of things, first of all, Anne, and I'm so delighted to see you there. Um, the public does not necessarily support license renewal for 60 years. Uh, we have not actually tested that. The public supports license renewal for nuclear power plants that continue to meet federal safety standards. When you bring in a time frame, which seems like a very long time frame, there is a little concern that there may not be inspections during that period. So one has to either just don't focus on the time frame. Just talk about license renewal, continued license renewal for these nuclear power plants, and people are fine. And the point is that they are constantly inspected, and if at any point um, they are not operating safely, they will be shut down. So if you have to bring up the, the period of time that you're talking about, fine, but don't really focus on it. I noticed that the nuclear industry in the United States is always putting out announcements. This plant has been licensed, had the license renewed for 20 years. Well, the public, you know, doesn't really necessarily care about or, or want to know 20 years, they want to know that the plant had its license renewed and that it will be continually inspected and if it's not safe, it will be shut down. Now, uh, the, in the United States, frankly, after the first uh, plant's license was renewed, uh, there was um, recognition that it was no big deal. It may be a big deal technically and in terms of getting uh, the license prepared and put through the process. But in terms of public relations, when there was good support for the plant locally, and the plant was operating safely, and the license was being renewed, and if the plant wasn't going to be safe at any particular time, the plant would be shut down, it really was no big deal. And that's why, in very quick process, 73 licenses were renewed. 
Now, if the federal government, if the central government is making it a big deal, yes. Uh, that, then it becomes a real question for the public, is this safe? So I can understand there's a different situation here. If I could add to that answer. Uh, and I know Ann's caution when she said about speaking in years, but let me just, uh, a couple things to add to that. Uh, I agree with what was said this morning, that it, uh, it's not a magic number when you hit 40 and you're safe at you know, 39 years and 364 days and then you're not safe at 40 years and one day. Uh, that's not the way it works. Uh, when we look at, in the United States, renewing a license, we keep talking about 40 to 60 years and an additional 20 years. And the clarification I wanted to give is the regulations allow for a license to be extended for up to 20 years. So when we do our determination, we look at whether or not the licensee is asking for an additional 20 years or they could ask for less than that. If the data they have does not support going up to 20 years, we could renew the license for a less period of time, for 10 years, for 15 years, and allow the licensee then to come back later to go, go further. It happens in the first round of license renewal that the plants have been able to demonstrate that 20 years is safe. When we look at our next uh, subsequent license renewal, the rule allows for up to 20 years. But if someone cannot provide data to support that and instead shows that they can operate safely to 70 years or 72 years, that could be a decision as well to just go to that plant, uh, standpoint from where they've demonstrated safety. And if I could just quickly add to that too, taking off what Vladimir said this morning, um, as president of the American Nuke Society and the president of my consulting firm, I work in 23 different countries. So I work with the owners, operators, and the regulatory authorities, and I see their positions. And not all regulatory authorities are created equal. Not all of them see things exactly the same as you can well imagine. And in many of the countries, some of the plants have been maintained better than others. But in essentially every country that's having any dialogue related to license renewal, they're acknowledging and recognizing that they want to bring those plants that maybe aren't at a safety standard today they could and should be up to that safety standard before they begin evaluating going beyond the current life of their license, irrespective of what that may be. And that also includes countries that were established this morning as having the 10-year periodic safety review not just those that have a license like ours and Atomic Energy Act of 40 years. So there are a number of variabilities out there, but there are a number of also relatively simple solutions to addressing those that do not require you to completely uh, not consider that your current fleet as being a safe operating fleet to be able to move on. But of course, that's going to be, like it or not, the technical issues can be addressed in my personal opinion. However, there are always political issues related to that. We have plenty of political issues, as you know all too well, in our country related to a number of things where we have the technology to move forward, but not the political will to do so. So in the country of France and other countries that are considering this, they must merge the technical and the political to make sure that the political decisions and the policy makers and the decision makers are adequately informed to grasp that there are indeed predecessor activities that have already been conducted that would support moving forward with extending the license of your current fleet of power reactors. So it is our hope that we will continue in the United States and other countries through the IEA to disseminate that kind of information to enable you to be successful in doing just that. There's another, another question here. Oui, uh, Claude Lefebvre, uh, retired uh, engineer from uh, Electricité de France. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Lubinsky. Uh, Mr. Chauvet uh, tell uh, us uh, this morning, at the beginning of this morning, that he will examine, examine the extension land authorization in regard of uh, criteria of generation three reactor, namely in France. In your presentation from uh, American uh, here, I didn't uh, know, I didn't uh, uh, hear any uh, consideration to this uh, kind of uh, respect of meeting new uh, in criteria, in particular uh, generation three. So I don't know if I if I'm fault or if I have not uh, heard it or if it's a main difference in approach 
from America and France. Because namely, in, uh, for in your presentation, I heard many things about uh, work on uh, research, on uh, materials and uh, concrete, on the embrutalment and many things like this. And uh, in the, uh, mainly in Mr. Chauvet's presentation, uh, he did not insist many much, much uh, very on uh, material in, uh, uh, be a big, uh, material in, uh, in, in life, in life, in on time. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, in, in response to uh, when I, uh, when I heard this morning uh, where uh, France is going with respect and it was stated Europe, uh, I, I cannot comment on that. I don't have the background on exactly how that's being implemented. Uh, what I interpret from that is that the design standards would change as you go beyond a certain period. If it's beyond 40 years, there is now a change in the design standards uh, that are believed to be an increase in safety over the standards that were set in place prior to the first 40 years. Uh, and I understood that to be the philosophy. The philosophy in the U.S. is that those design standards we used were safe during the first 40 years. If there was an issue or concern about safety during those first 40 years, it was addressed during those 40 years. It may have been identified through an inspection effort. It may have been identified through an event either at that plant or an, a similar plant in the U.S. or internationally, but a design was changed and the design basis for that plant was changed at that time. So therefore, as we discussed, at, a, at age 39 years, 364 days, we believe that design was safe. We have no reason to believe that design isn't safe the next day when they enter that 40, beyond 40-year 40 period. That's the reason we focus on aging management programs, because what we do understand changes as time goes on in the, in the year 40, the year 60 is not a magic date, but continuing to look at the components of the plant to make sure that they are continued to perform their safety function continue to remain, remain robust as they are continue to be exposed to their environmental conditions, mostly the radiation effects as well as the heat effects. So we don't believe changing the design standards at that point are necessary. We don't use the license renewal as a backstop to change the design standards. If we believe it's necessary to change a design standard at any point, we will do it as it arises, make that decision, do an analysis, and require that change. And as I also said, some standards to improve safety are made along the way based on finding new information. And we may require a licensee to do that or they may voluntarily do that. And that continues to be the new standard that they must meet as they continue to move forward during the first 40 years as well as into license renewal. adding to Mr. Bishkoff's comments from IEA is that a number of other countries are evaluating the process the United States has used and acknowledge and recognize that you can use that to the current fleet of plants based on where that is to utilize the basis for going forward for extending the license whatever periodic time that may be 10, 20, 30, 40 years whatever period can be supported technically. So as you know, each country has the sovereign right to establish and determine through its regulatory authority what the basis of that acceptability will be. We're just saying that a number of the countries, including the United States, has determined the acceptability of a course of action that utilizes the current licensing and design basis with all the upgrades and enhancements that have been conducted to date and will continue to be conducted in accordance with lessons learned as a basis for moving forward and not just establishing it as necessarily a particular point in time related to a generation three standard or beyond. Are there any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Ah, yeah. okay. Uh, we are rapidly running so, out of time. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm working at the communication division of the okay. CA. Uh, in France, some NGOs are trying to change the legal framework around a lifetime ex extension, uh, advocating that it's some, just like creating a new uh, facility 
So, um, and so involve them in a, a, in a heavy procedure of uh, inquiries and so on. So I would like to know whether you've got uh, in the United States such, some sort of arguments from NGOs. No. I, I won't speak for our entire NGO community, but uh, yes, we do have, uh, we have had comments uh, along the way. Uh, we have a process in the United States that allows for the public uh, to actually petition the NRC uh, to make changes to its regulations and also make changes specifically to any plant. Uh, we've had uh, petitions come in uh, about specific designs of reactors that they not be relicensed, some based uh, essentially on uh, Fukushima activities. Uh, we've had some plant or some NGOs come in or some members of the public, I should say. Uh, to state you've put design standards in place for new plant designs. Uh, we don't believe you should relicense those plants unless uh, they meet those the same design standards. Uh, on those petitions, we have uh, gone through a very uh, lengthy uh, process of evaluation as well as public comment to make sure that people understand uh, our position. Uh, and in dispositioning those, uh, we have stood by the position that I've discussed this morning. Uh, that we continue to believe that the current safety standards for the operating fleet is appropriate, is adequate, and provides a reasonable assurance of safety, and therefore are not making those additional changes. If those changes are needed, we will do those as they are identified uh, and make those changes or require those changes to the plan at that time. Uh, so I hope that answers. We do, we do hear that from the public, and we do evaluate that as we're going through our processes. Uh, let me also note, uh, I mentioned this morning with subsequent license renewal that there was a, uh, a proposal in front of our uh, five-member commission about the changes that would be made. And what I didn't talk about is the administrative part of that. And if those changes as proposed by the or that we proposed to the commission to start with move forward, that would actually be a new rulemaking that we would go through. And when we do that, that would open up our license renewal rule again to comments from the public. We did receive comments from the public already in making our decisions, held a, a variety of meetings along the way. That's when I said I had 600 different recommendations coming in. They were some of the recommendations. But this would start the rulemaking process, which allows for multiple uh, times for the public and NGOs to interact with us in providing their comments. So we could, if we move forward with subsequent license journal, we could receive those kind of comments again as part of our rulemaking process, and we would need to address them at that time. I've been advised that we may take a little more time here, so if there are additional questions, please feel free to raise your hand high. There are two in the middle. C'est bon? Oui. DDBT from Areva. I have a question about, well, I understood that up to now, every applicant uh, for license renewal got the license, was granted the license. And, but sometimes, uh, was it conditional to investment to be made by the operator? And can we have an idea of the uh, level of investment which was uh, at stake in some of the decisions for license renewal? Yeah, I would ask, uh, I'm going to ask Masood to uh, help with this question as well, but I'll start. Uh, as you said, the license renewal applications that have come in to date um, that have been completed have been approved. As part of that process, prior to that uh, applicant coming in, they've done an assessment to determine whether plant modifications were needed and have agreed to make those changes before they came in. In other cases, we've asked questions along the way during the review that have led them to decide to make changes to their plant. They may have decided that they believed it was safe the way they presented their program to us as part of license renewal and their aging management. We'd asked questions that said, we don't have the assurance that that program provides reasonable safety and would ask more questions. And that led them to decide to make design changes along the way. Uh, and some, and in most cases, it was not a design change, it was an inspection plan, where they would actually do more inspections or commit to a replacement of a component at a certain date, rather than put the inspection plan in place. 
uh, and that would be the type of changes that took place. So when we say the license applications were approved, they weren't always approved as originally submitted. They were modified along the way based on our asking of questions and identification of issues. You've asked about a cost. Uh, I Ms. talked earlier about uh, cost. Maybe he can expand on that. Based on, based on information that I have, uh, the investment that plans gone through the license renewal application been anywhere from two billion to five billion, and this is what I have. And nobody is officially putting the information out, but uh, that's the average. Now, if I. Those are investment, right, across things. To do license renewal. To do investment to upgrade the systems and components. Yeah, I think the, the side conversation that's taking place here is when I'm we sorry, talk about that. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my head around that number. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause I could build a new plant for five billion, uh, so that's it's okay if that's the information you have okay now if i may make a comment or a remark about the question that previous was asked the communication that nrc has with public or allows public ngo and any technical people in the united states to contribute to the process I believe it's so effective that if you look at the trend that we had in the beginning of the license renewal process, when the NGO and other people commenting or attending the uh, meetings that I mentioned in my presentation, used to be uh, 20, 30, 100 people. But recently, we have seen maybe one, two people attending those meetings. The reason is because the openness and also the process that NRC has to get involved, public and NGOs and everybody else involved in the process. One of the examples, good example of it is when NRC was doing revision to the goal from Rev 1 to Rev 2, I believe it took, uh, I don't know, John, if I remember correctly, but 3,000 or some amount, enormous number of comments that NRC got to improve Gold Ref 2. It took a lot of time, a lot of investment, and every comment on it. So those are the things that has created a trust between the public that when the question was asked that is public in the United States trust NRC's process, I believe is yes. I believe they have seen it during attending those meetings with the utilities that how rigorous NRC is to pursuing ideas that improves the life of the plants. May I add a comment on the, the pricing question? I'm, I'm not going to trust my memory to, to quote a number, but there was a well documented report that was recent or that was published by the OECD in 2010 that did go, and they did an international level survey of, of which the U.S. participated, EPRI and NEI were on that committee. You can get that, it's a 2010 report, you can get it off their web page, and it's called the Price of Long-Term Operations, and it compares data from the U.S. plants and also international plants. And it has been cited in a number of recent journal articles, especially throughout the United States, as the NRC is starting to talk about subsequent license renewal. So I, I would use that report. It's a, it's a citable document. Good morning. I am Cécile Logier from EDF, and I am also a chairwoman of the AFSEN. We produce and edit the RCC rules. And, um, my question is uh, for the panel, but especially maybe for Mr. Lubinsky and Ms. Bernhoff. Uh, you mentioned uh, some collective efforts from the industry for producing knowledge or research or standards, all, all stuff collective. 
and um, do you think uh, there is a real added value for these collective efforts? And uh, a critic factor is that uh, these industrial uh, inputs are recognized and because they are referenced and recognized by regulator. So my question is, do you think it, it's important in general for safety and uh, to get better results, better safety, and in the continuity to, to get uh, industry uh, continuously involved in collective efforts because uh, it's not so easy. <laughs> uh, you make some very good points there. The, the answer would be yes, it's very important uh, through publications of the technical research. So I'll, I'll go to the EPRI reports. They said over 200 EPRI reports are referenced in the aging management programs in the GAL report and in the IGAL report. We continue to update those references based on research results, inspection results, and operating experience that we collect internationally. Uh, for the utilities to use those reports, uh, like if they're doing an inspection for an aging management program and they want to use the EPRI document for reactor vessel internals, they actually have to use a version of that report that has been submitted to the NRC and approved by the NRC. So the higher tier, higher criteria documents to assure safety and inspection are actually approved by the NRC for the utilities to use. I would say from the NRC perspective, when we look at collaborative research, uh, many of the benefits you see is when you get collaborative research, you get more data points. Uh, the more data you have, uh, the more certainty you have in the research. Uh, also, uh, through collaborative research, you're getting different opinions from different experts, which again allows you to look at the certainty and uncertainty associated with that data that helps in making a decision. As Sherry said, when, uh, when we reach consensus through those groups, uh, it helps the efficiency of going through the process of reviewing uh, license renewal or renewing any safety issues that we're dealing with. Uh, when you have that consensus among experts as well as additional pieces of data. Uh, that does not mean that if you do not have that collaborative research, you cannot demonstrate that. Uh, it just means that there may be more questions and more work that would need to be done, uh, or there may be some additional backstops in place as meaning more conservatism, whether it's doing more frequent inspections, more detailed inspections, uh, or possibly even uh, replacing at some period of time. Uh, so, the, uh, I'd say the collaborative work uh, provides a lot of benefits, uh, decreases the uncertainty, increases the efficiency in moving forward, uh, but there are still other means and other ways to uh, demonstrate safety. We are going to permit one last question. I'm not sure what, who that last question is coming from. I just know there's one last question. I'm going to let them dictate. Bruno Chevalier, Oil Industry. My question is for Mr. Lubinsky. In your uh, license renewal process, you mentioned the risk assessment analysis. What is the, uh, the purpose and the target of this uh, analysis? Is it just the protection of the workers within the NPP? Or after Fukushima, has it been enlarged to the protection of workers and the surrounding population? and with which criteria. Thank you. We actually, uh, when we look at the initial licensing of plants, uh, we're looking not just at workers, we are looking at the people around the uh, uh, facility, what the dose would be. Uh, there are certain siting criteria in place, uh, and that is done during initial licensing, and the assumption for license renewals, that, that licensing basis continues to be maintained as you go into license renewal. The entire review process of the safety review ensures that those systems and those basic assumptions you had in place with your initial license basis continue to be maintained, continue to be true. Uh, based on the analysis that you've done of the plan operations, uh, the degradation mechanisms that may take place, the inspection frequency. So really it's the safety assessment and determining that 
the components, the system structures and components can continue to perform their function so that initial licensing bases that had been modified along the way during the first year, 40 years can be maintained. With respect to Fukushima, as I said, we're looking at the, the analysis as well, and most of it is the same basis of looking at are the plants continuing to meet that assumed licensing basis that we licensed to in the first place, uh, and are there possible beyond design basis events that may occur, which could result in large accidents or large doses, and what uh, procedures, processes, mechanisms that are in place to mitigate those? What strategies do you have to mitigate those? And we're not doing that as part of license renewal. We're doing that in a real-time basis in response to the Fukushima event. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to join me in thanking John Lubinsky, the NRC, Masu Tapazoli of Arriva, Sherry Barnhart from EPRI, and Ann Bisconti from BRI for their very incredibly important and very impressive presentations. Don't, don't, not yet. It's important to note they've compressed a lot of information to a short period of time. You've heard the U.S. perspective this morning. You'll get a more of international flavor in the afternoon. We are here available to you during the break, so if there's any questions you have for us, please don't hesitate to ask us. Again, thank all of you. We thank all of you on behalf of the panel for giving us an opportunity to tell you what we're doing in the United States. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.